Così mi arriva. Fai su no. Hide floating media controls. Così sparisce tutto. Ok. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Today we have the second seminar uh, delivered by um, Andrea Mannocci from this seminar. You already know him. We also have Paolo Manghi, uh, also from East CNR with us today. And uh, you might have seen the email that they sent yesterday about a new thesis proposal, a uh, joint uh, proposal between University of Padua and East CNR, and also do the internship at CNR, uh, which means that you work with them and us, but not necessarily is needed go there also because with COVID restrictions you never know what's going to happen so basically it's an internship but you can also do it remotely which is good uh, in many cases so think about that read the proposal if you're interested just drop an email and if you're interested in other things connected to that idea just propose them you might be interested in that too uh, the, the seminar uh, so the seminar introduced many concepts about scholarly communication and today you will see even more in-depth uh, concepts and so new ideas that you might be interested in. Another thing that I shared with you, this is independent from uh, our guests, is that I shared with you eight internship books from PricewaterCoopers. Uh, they are in English, they are going to present the company the 15th of December for before your presentations, they are going to talk about the company, and so you know what that is about. If you're interested about that, before the meeting, just try, uh, just send me an email, and uh, and you can talk with the manager of the company, and then you take it from there. Uh, I'm not super interested, honestly, in those internships, but if you are, I'm happy to supervise uh, the work. I mean, I'm more interested in research stuff that is very oriented, but if you like that, I'm happy to follow with that, okay? And to work on that too. Uh, that's it. So thank you very, very much. Uh, you can also okay. speak without the mask. I'm going to put mine. They already know you, but if you want to introduce yourself, do whatever you want. Yeah. And thank you very much for being here. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Mm, uh, so in this uh, lecture, you are supposed to learn or see uh, some context and uh, get a grasp on the complexity of research and scientific communication and uh, how they roughly work. You see most of this stuff yesterday, and today you're just doing a quick recap, which is functional to what I'm talking about. Uh, then I'm going through the value proposition of all this thing like why you should care about or why and at least maybe not interesting for you but why people about this uh, these uh, kind of applications and why it moves uh, business hi um, we're going through some applications and uh, explore some interesting examples uh, and research trends and uh, we're going through research uh, scholarly data management some models and re examples and I, I will finish with challenges and ideas and other troubles uh, so yeah we are going to recap uh and this is basically the same thing like uh, i'm going to have a bigger part on open air uh, which is the project i'm uh, working on and uh, through that we are going to see some some concept that might you might be aware of and you might be familiar with from this course and other and others from your uh, from your curricula uh, i am a researcher at east cnr I've, I've been like moving a bit around europe uh, and recently i i had a uh, phd uh, in 2016 i started a phd uh, then in the uk and then after brexit i came back so to, in, from 2019, I'm back where I work, where, I, where everything started. Uh, I'm mainly involved in open air and ESC projects, and I, I work with. Um, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm interested in data science and data engineering, centrometric of science, which is basically a buzzword for anything that 
tries to do research on research. So it's like meta research, like because you, you, you it's a self introspection on how research works and uh, how it's ruled and which are the, we're going to see that later. It's communication and, uh, and so on and so forth on open science and all the technologies that are around in the ecosystem for uh, that enable open science and, and allows. Um, so for the introduction, I, I, I thought that um, it was, it's, it's nice to make a paradigm. Like when I was at your age, which is some years ago, uh, sadly, and um, I, I used to have a book, which is this one, uh, not this edition, like the fourth one, but which means I'm old. Um, and in this book, uh, pretty much every example in all the database classes were modern uh, banks and universities. I don't know your textbooks, what they do, but I, I was plenty of examples with customers accounts, employees branch, or students, grades, professors, and so on and so forth. And, and the systems were very easy to grasp, were very easy to understand the examples it, I mean, it, it is a textbook, so it needs to be clear. And uh, it's easy to, to, understand, to understand how things work for the sake of the of, of degree. But then I went to research and uh, things, the, the system that, ha that is modeled is far more complex. And this is no joke. I mean, it, this is true. This is a true model um, that we are going to see like skimming through uh, afterwards. And um, of course, any, anything, any aspect of the, of the real world can be seen in many levels of complexity. And uh, this is, uh, I'm taking this from a professor that I had uh, that was like supervising me in the UK. And it was like, uh, well, research is very easy. Like you have researchers that do not have money and funders that have money. And the only thing you do is just you know, you get good people, you do good research, you get the money and you go on and that's one it's a self-sustaining thing if you're, if you're good at that. But then you can see things in a, fi in a finer grain where you have founders that have money and then you have people that form consortia, they participate, they have project proposals, they win the grants and they get funded. The people cooperate, they write uh, papers, the papers get cited, people get evaluated, and this is how like, you, you plug these into the cycle before, and you get a sense on how, which are the main actors and the main uh, things, the main relations that get the things going. Then you have research communities, which might be within the project, across projects, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. And then you have like research life cycles that like the one we were uh, checking yesterday, which get into far more details where does university working and uh, and uh, all the publication cycle, the evaluation, uh, all the indicators for uh, research impact assessment and things get complicated as much as you want uh, very easily from, from simple that we, we started with. Uh, scholarly communication is crazy lately because there is an exponential growth of, of publications, meaning articles and dissemination in general of, of uh, scientific findings. And uh, there was an article, which now is quite old, because I think it was 2018, uh, but I was saying basically that on PubMed, which is index uh, of, of, of um, uh, health and, uh, and biomedical uh, publications, there was a deposition every 30 seconds. A deposition mean, means a new article or an update of an old article every 30 seconds, which is endless. Like if you are a practitioner, a researcher in this field, it means that you are constantly shoveled new knowledge to the face and you need to be on top of the state art. It's almost impossible. Um, so someone suggests that, that the scholarly communication now it's, it's like an expanding universe because uh, there's a, this web of, of authors and papers and ideas and tools and frameworks that is expanding, expanding constantly. And, um, and, and while, while ages ago, like centuries ago, it was like everything was done with people sending letters via mail. That's it. Like if, if you think like things were communicated by a 
via envelopes and everything was there as simple as that uh, and on top of that you have open science we saw yesterday so there is a, a push for making science fair and everything crack open uh, to support reproducibility which is a big deal um, in, in, there's a lot of fuss about that uh, and publish all the research artifact in step of the research life cycle so uh, to make everything inspectable and for everybody and this involves not only publications which is the traditional mean of, of dissemination but also data software presentations um, anything that can be raw or intermediate uh, or final stage so in a greater landscape uh, just I want to convince you that research is not something that you can it's isolated it's not like a university or a bank but it's something that's multifaceted high frequency global scale is a vast market because it moves billions and uh, and it's it's it, we, i mean it surrounds us at least in terms of as a society because and there are socio-economic and and geopolitical push drivers that that uh, are driving and are influenced by uh by research so the value proposition and why you should care I think it, it, it's contained in this paper that I'm linking here, and um, it's basically the manifesto, manifesto of Science of Science. It says that Science of Science offers a deep quantitative understanding of the, um, uh, I can't see that, uh, re uh, relational structure between scientists, institutions, and ideas, because it facilitates the identification of fundamental mechanisms responsible for scientific discovery. And the value proposition of Science of Science uh, inges on hypothesis that with a deeper understanding of the factors behind successful science, we can have um, and, and uh, we can enhance the prospect of science as a well, whole and uh, to move efficiently uh, to more efficiently address societal problems. And um, so, basically, I need the, me the mechanics uh, and, and the equilibria and the turning points and the disruptive mechanisms that are behind science and scholarly communication and research, um, it's important because uh, it can help us into making these processes more performing, more performing better. Um, and um, understanding the major drivers for successful science is important because like, it facilitates and it, it fastens everything and uh, makes um, knowledge diffusion quicker, and, uh, and discovery, discoveries that can change our life in, uh, and move it to a better place, more achievable. Um, and of course, because it moves millions and, and, and um, I mean, it's all public money. Research projects are, and are uh, paid with public money, with taxpayers. And uh, allocating resources better means that you can have uh, save money and you can steal investments where it's more strategic you can have a better impact and a return on investment for the society and uh, all this is possible if you forecast you, you anticipate trends you anticipate what it, what's going to be the next big thing in the next 10 years let's say what is the promising avenue for curing cancer for example or for covid uh, disease so, and these pictures, uh, these um, cycles on the, on the right uh, are from business intelligence, which is kind of um, counterintuitive because business intelligence, we think about it usually for insurances, banks, and, and so on. And uh, why here it is a public sector, but you can, it, it applies anyway, because you can describe, you can have stats about what's, what happens in research, you can try to predict trends, and you can try to see how these changes can be anticipated and what, what they imply uh, to, the, to the surrounding environment. Uh, so it's a, in, as a field, it's great for a fresh start, so, um, because it's, it, it involves many aspects, many technological uh, challenges. Uh, it's great for academia because deals with their system in the first place and it's great for in for industry and there are a lot of uh, stakeholders uh, founders investors hedge funds the publishers which are publishing any any research funding and uh, even small startups 
uh, are in this field because they, they there is a cut for for for, for everybody in a, uh, in this domain. So interesting applications. There there is a, a great overview that as we get from this paper, the first one that I already mentioned, and other two books uh, that are basically I mean what's possible to do um, with the data that, that is produced and metadata that are that is produced research. And um, so science of science is a multidisciplinary blend of skills. It gets from scientometrics, informatics, and bibliometric, all the quantitative methods for measuring science and impact at large. Then from sociology of science, it gets it draws uh, theoretical concepts and processes that rule uh, knowledge diffusion and uh, like demography, like people moving around and so on. Uh, from science and, and innovation studies, it, it, it gets all the tooling for, for uh, identifying pathways that triggers or actually progress in science. And from STEM, computer science and mathematics and physics and so on, it gets all statistics uh, and modeling and network science, graphery, artificial intelligence, uh, natural language processing and so on that, that you can apply on top of the data. And uh, thing that, so applications that, that can be supported, there are, this is, uh, citation networks are one of the most uh, classic application um because uh citation is basically the currency that in academia we have uh to to get evaluated like when you write a paper if you size that probably probably i mean traditionally is it's it's um, has a less value than a, than a highly cited paper because it means that people uh, that are citing you find it interesting and then can base their research on on your on top of your, of your findings so studying how people get get cited and cite the others can can disclose uh, can can help us understanding how impact is made how people are get get rewarded and uh, and and where is important research needed these things are changing now because because of open science but it's still an important an, an important application uh, then we can start exploring collaboration networks, uh, trying to see what are the differences between uh, early career uh, scientists, seniors, if there is any difference between genders, like there's someone that studied which are the collaborations of, uh, of uh, female researchers and male researchers and found out that yes, there are differences, and which is a shame. Um, there's community detection, trying to see why people stick together, how to stick together, which are in the community dynamics, and uh, trying to see whether there, if if big groups or small groups work in, in in different ways, and how what they do, what what are the fundamental distinctions between these characteristics. Uh, this is an old study of mine. Um, I was just drawing the intracontinental collaborations. Uh, between so basically trying to see which are the apps within the continent that collaborate together, and here I was just drawing the intercontinental ones, so apps across continents that that have publications and they publish uh, to journals and venues. Um, another important thing is about these bridges towards demography because it, it relates to how people move and relocate uh, around the globe, uh, changing jobs, basically, like what I've done uh, in the past, moving to UK and then back to, to Italy. And so to try to understand how people move, identify patterns and trends, uh, predict how and they will and how and why they will uh, move in the future. So trying to find strategies to attract scientists. This is something that China has done. Uh, a lot of Chinese researchers moved out, went to the US, whatever, and so they tracked them back. They explored what, what, what was their scientific production. They selected the top ones and they showed money to them, asking, to, asking them to go back to China 
yeah? because they they want to have more pressure on top on the academic market academic market so um, it's something practical there are governments that are um, shaping politics after this data um, and um, and uh, it's, it's also important to understand how um, um, this can shape the research ecosystem so like when people move uh, usually they carry knowledge with them so if um, i was here then i moved to uk i learned something new and then i come back possibly i'm taking some something with me that i can i can start doing with uh with, with my new colleagues so in this affect the production the scientific production you're going to have in the future it might affect career uh it might affect my research impact and how we form and uh, consortium groups and uh, and project and and have grants uh there are tools for example for tracing people movement or inferring uh affiliations this this uh, group uh, here uh, developed a, uh, a tool that pictures for example uh, pathways for for a specific uh, discipline like on the right uh, there's um, th there are the movements of uh, of uh, scientists that that are within the same community. So it looks like that, for example, there is a highway between East Coast and and, uh, and West Coast of the US, because people tend to jump uh, between these two um, hotspots. And uh, so yeah, these are the papers that where they describe the two, and these are other other references that just popped up but basically it's about brain drain and brain gain and uh, after political changes so like try to see which are the flows of people after something something happens in in politics which is non trivial like you you have a war you have a restriction bans then people start to move, move less um, and then there are other studies uh, that, that try to correlate relocation to scientific production so and, and impact uh this is another work i've done in 2019 it's um like basically how people get papers into conferences this is in it, it's it's a big thing for example in, in computer science like we pub, tend to publish papers in in conferences so when you publish a paper in a conference then you need to go there to present the paper and um, the idea was you know try to see uh if there are substantial differences uh on 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 uh, where people tend to um, place and dispatch their papers and for example it turns out that, that european which is the blue here um tend to have a lot of pool of conferences that are mostly within europe there are a lot of opportunities while the us tends to go more tend to send uh, papers mostly to intercontinental um conferences possibly to Europe because there are more opportunities let's say um, then another application is about research trends and dynamics you can describe where money goes and who gets it it gets distributed over time uh, what happens after changes like policies mandates or geopolitical changes and and you can suggest and recommend and support project proposals uh, like consortia when they are forming up and um, and so on and so forth career dynamics another application like you can try to see which are the drivers for a successful career and uh, and which are the, the factors that imp can influence or, and, and you can draw benefit from uh, then there's a whole bunch of, of, of stuff about uh topics so which are the topics that are uh co-curing or they, they tend to stick together and how topics change over time. Um, for an example I always make is, is about computational biology or computational drug discovery, let's say, something that wasn't there before. It's something, and at some point, people from computer science and people from biomedical studies, they understood that probably joining was a promising venue. DNA sequencing is another one. Like it's it's something that you do with computers and uh, it cannot be done manually and and it's it's in so it's, it's in this interdisciplinary and before the communities were not talking and then at some point they merge and and they draw from 
from multiple subjects, the skills and, and, the, core, and the core knowledge to invent something new. And there are studies that, that precisely do this and they study how th there are these radical disruptive changes um, in, in, in how topics are, knowledge uh, is shaped. There are also other things like uh, this one, it's, it's, it's about knowledge uh, push and pull, basically like when we, the idea here was that if you, if a journey, if a journal gets cited, the, the articles within a journal get cited, basically they, the knowledge is pulled from the journal towards the country that are citing them, while um, and it's, it's uh, pushed actually. So basically, if if you have, if you have a paper. And, uh, and, and if you have a journal and the cites lot, uh, references a lot of, of articles that are within the journal, it means that there is a knowledge draw uh, towards Italy for, for anything that's produced there. And if Italy doesn't publish anything in the venue, it, 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 it looks like a debt. So we are consuming a lot, but we are producing nothing that's, that's actionable for the journal. So the idea was, uh, to conceptualize uh, this kind of uh, knowledge credit and knowledge debit uh, using citations and references and uh, all at a, at a country level. And then there's the whole thing about full text mining and uh, so named entity recognition, entity linking, part of switch attacking, uh, discuss analysis. And all this is functional for the aforementioned analysis and a bunch more. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's about getting the PDFs, extracting text and doing stuff inside. Uh, so um, scholarly management, scholarly knowledge management, sorry. Uh, as you can think that, uh, I, I, I mean, it's my understanding that you have done ontologies in this, in this uh, course. So uh, as you can imagine, there are a bunch of, of bibliograph bibliographic formats and standards that these ones are rather old but i mean they're still there there is the first one there is a etf uh, rfc about it so it's, it's a standard uh, they are general purpose they're not specific to research but they can bend be bent towards modeling uh research uh products and in fact that's what happens but there are also others uh model knowledge models that represent the, uh, the better this domain. Uh, one is Serif. Uh, it's, I mean, it's been started in 1988 and it's still ongoing. So that's, uh, I mean, it's been stable for a while, but now they, they, are, they are planning to change it and to adapt it to open science. And um, so it models like persons, organizations, and, uh, and uh, projects at, at its core. And then it has a surround uh, an, an environment. An, surrounding environment of, of, of things like uh, fundings, uh, all the, the up outputs like publications uh, and products, patents uh, that are uh, related to, to research activities, down to indicators, measurement, uh, facilities, equipment used in research. And that's why is the complex big boy that we have seen at the beginning with tons of relations uh, underneath. Uh, this, by the way, it's like it's partially used by open air. So now we're going to, uh, to see that uh, afterwards. There is a, a SPAR ontologies is a portfolio of ontologies uh, that are um, modeling all kinds of aspects of, uh, of uh, semantic public research and publishing. SPAR is, is, is about semantic publishing. Um, so you have uh, works uh, that, that, that can be research papers or specifications of opinion, then they can be published to conferences, workshops, journals, and uh, each document is, if it's quite clear, but anyway, yeah. Uh, each document then can have sections like um, discourse analysis, like introduction, conclusions, uh, meet methods, so on and so forth. There are vocabularies. For this one, for example, is the document component, uh, meaning like discourse analysis. And uh, 
there are a bunch like here and they, they model like from the articles from citations and their nature uh the model like the reviewing process the publishing process all the people all the people that are uh involved in the research and in writing the paper uh it's like you name it everything uh and then you have classification schemes classification schemes is about um trying to quantize uh knowledge because uh knowledge is a continuum you know like sound waves are it's an analog signal but then you have mp3s that do quantization and and make it digital and you have the same thing like knowledge is continuing but uh it needs to be categorized for practical reasons like imagine you go to a library and there is no section no, there are medals. where is your book you don't know and there cannot be experts without uh, a discipline you are expert in and uh, be a university without subjects like you can't attend something that uh, clearly is not targeted to, to a specific um, uh, subject and uh, in in this work uh, i reported it in the in below uh, which is in under review at the moment uh, we discovered that that's very true and uh, we need classification screen but we took it to the extreme apparently we identified 42 classification scheme main ones and many are, were discarded. Basically, every digital library, every uh, funder, every national uh, research evaluation framework has its own. And uh, and these ones, like the ones that are used only locally, we just dropped them out of the window. And still, we we ended up with forty-two, uh, with, with twenty-two uh, single discipline and twenty multidisciplinary uh, classification scheme, and we ended up in finding high variability there's no agreement on on how knowledge should be organized and mostly like this is so because of political vanity like mm, uh, basically uh, people do not like to be placed especially professors and experts who don't like to be placed in in, in sub fields if they don't want to be there so they prefer to sketch another another taxonomy rather than being well, you don't want to be like um, say that you place again computational uh, biology under computer science and probably people from medical studies they don't want to be, be there they prefer to be in another place in, in the in the tree and uh, and also there are political interests because um then research evaluation is based on 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 classification uh, schemes which means that if you change if, if you change how knowledge is presented you might you and your lab could be leading scientists in one field and if you change and plug a classification scheme uh, under the hood then you are not leading anymore you someone else is leading and uh, and um, and this of course as props because it, it affects how our research is evaluated um why is this? Oh, okay. So, um, despite uh, the presence of models and all these taxonomies and ontologies for the research and for uh, for, for, for topics, um, the systems that are currently available do not really stick to uh, specification sometimes, and this can be like for legacy choices that you have, you have done you have, you have done it. Uh, uh, developed as a service you didn't know about standards then or maybe standards were not available and um, and you just basically stick to that you don't need to you don't want to uh, adapt uh, you, what has been already developed to to uh, something that wasn't there or you didn't know about and so uh, some examples of, of um, scholarly uh, knowledge systems online. So there is one system, which is research, academia, and science, but there are many observers and many representations because there is no winning uh, system. Like they do, they are modeled after different needs, after different uh, applications. And basically every relevant stakeholders in the system can have their own, uh, their own view. 
universities, publishers, funders, uh, foundations, they have, they can have their interest and, and they can possibly model um, the, the, the search in, in, in their peculiar way, which means uh, there's a, a significant uh, amount of effort because the resources, the resources and money are spent to model the same thing over and over again. Information is possibly redundant and overlapping. A few examples. There are a plethora of, of literature, literature repositories, and, uh, which means that basically, like every university has one, Padova has this one at the, at the, at the very bottom. Uh, so every researcher that is publishing uh, here in Padova at some point put the publication and the metadata about the public in there. In PISA, we have the same, in CNR, another one. So, um, and all this data gets shoveled into systems and then they are exposed uh, through this protocol, which is OAIPMH, for anyone possibly to be harvested. Uh, the same happens for, there are, uh, because now data are important and, uh, and uh, we want to get them published. Uh, so there are publishers and research community and research infrastructure that, that devised uh, data repositories. And there are also directories, registries that list them all. So sometimes now when you publish the, the speak, so let's say nature tells you, uh, you should publish it as well find the best place uh, where to put them. So you go to these uh, directories, which is like yellow pages, and uh, you try to find which is the, the most possible one for your, for your discipline. Um, so basically every, every publisher uh, in, the, in the field uh, has their information somewhere available online, so usually on websites, but it doesn't mean that they are um, releasing them freely in machine readable formats usually they i mean they make business out of that so they do have no interest whatsoever to release the data they have there are some exceptions for example springer nature uh it's it's distributing this uh data set SciGraph. now it's it's um it's available for for free as json ld and it's a nice um, let's say toy project it doesn't cover all science, it's just Springer Nature uh, literature. But it can be loaded into a tribal store. You can sparkle queries over that. I did it, or it's, it, it's nice and it can be explored through the, to the website as well. You can uh, then uh, recompact the data, uh, take them away from, from, from RDF and analyze them on Jupyter notebooks or on Spark or other technology that is more suitable locally or in, on, on cluster. Uh, then you have uh, data sets that, model after, uh, that are modeled after persons. The ORCID is a global registry, is like um, an agrafe, basically. They try to be. Uh, but so it's like a registration office uh, for researchers and collaborators. So they, 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 you can go there and you get a finger like this um, number uh, that is yours and only yours. And whenever you publish something, you can say, hey, that's me. So there are no, there's no question that's you publishing the paper. It cannot be your anonym or some cannot be missed in principle. It shouldn't be mistakes. Uh, there are also a funding company or funding organizations that are publishing data about projects like in the Europe as this term here and uh, all the expenses and start and end dates of projects that, that have been funded, they are publicly available in XML, download them. You can know which are the partners. You can see the abstracts. You can see pretty much every detail of everything that's funded. Everything rejected and not funded, not there. But everything has been accepted and funded. It, it's it's, it's uh, in, this, in this website. In, I mean, in this web, on the portal and, and as a data set. There are also other uh, stakeholders that model uh, institutions. Uh, Grid, it's a big database 
that model institutions and sub branches uh, they have you know, like where they are placed and uh, all the names and uh, and variations in different languages. Uh, Unpaywall has um, as a service is a nice service. Basically, if you try to to read a paper that's behind paywall, which is something that yesterday Gina explained. So usually research is funded by public taxpayers' money, uh, so it's been paid already. But then when whenever anyone it is traditionally uh, wanted to read the paper, then you had to pay. And uh, so with open science and open access, uh, this is tried to, this is disrupted. This mechanism has been disrupted. And um, Unpaywall is a service that basically when you end up on, a, on something that's behind the paywall, it tells you, hey, there is a free version that if you click there, you just, you can read the paper. And uh, so they have all PDFs and uh, of uh, public research. Of, I mean, open access uh, papers. There's this is a bit um, on the edge, but basically, peer review is is a close process. Usually, like like peer reviewers do not know, let's say, or um, who who are whom reviewing, and the people that are reviewed don't know who were the who are the peer reviews. There is this kind of secrecy to um, protect identities and uh, and possible and possible words between scientists because they are can be picky let's say sometimes and peculiar and uh, so there is a lot of interest to keep everything sensitive but there are some realities that instead try to open uh, as well this process to make it transparent just to see how people review papers within a certain community and uh, there are a few data sets but yeah it's it's it, it's growing and uh, of course like this is free text so be exposed to NLP and all kind of uh, uh, natural language analysis. And then you have another family of, of um, services, which are open science graphs, which are many initiatives that are being born uh, to contribute and or consume information. And these, these are not all of them, some of them. <coughs> so Google Scholar is the most uh, and like established one, let's say. It used to be a spare time project at Google. Uh, like a couple of guys once said, oh, let's try to improve um, like, uh, the you know, like processes about knowledge discovery in scientific uh, fields. And they came up with this byproduct of, of Google in, in index servicing. So basically there's the same web crawler that goes around and, and creates the index that you search on when you will something they also create the, the, the index stuff and put them away whenever they, they end up something that's that looks barely academical sometimes it creates funny results because um, i don't have the, the screenshot now but i ended up funding finding um a mini restaurant on google scholar which is of course it shouldn't be there but um sometimes like google crawlers get tricked by by some aspects and they end up thinking that it was a paper even if it wasn't uh also google scholar indices product republishing which is all these um let's say venues journals and conferences that are not scientifically sound they are pseudoscience and this is why like opening a parenthesis that when when someone says I've seen this paper on COVID or vaccines and I found it on Google Scholar, that doesn't mean anything. It's like I found this business on Yellow Pages. What doesn't mean that's good? They could be just incompetent persons doing a job. But so it doesn't. Google Scholar doesn't is not uh, gatekeeping. It's, it doesn't provide quality to the content they have there. And they also have the same for data sets and patients, something rather new, but it's they, they are the same for that. Uh, Elsevier is one of the pub, is probably the biggest publisher in the world, and uh, they have a, a aggregation system that tries to uh, put everything in, in one place, all the literature in the world. And um, it's it, this is not for free. This comes at a, they, they want lots of money to be able to consume their data either via API or via DAPs. And um, 
it's a commercial license 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 so it's basically like you cannot do research you can do research if you have agreements uh, with them but otherwise it's it's usually you need to pay lots and it's not available for everybody we don't have uh an agreement with them for example um And the same is uh, Web of Science. It's a very old uh, scientific index that turned uh, into uh, a bigger service at, at the moment. And, and what is sad is that all the public uh, research evaluation frameworks are mostly based on these two players, meaning uh, that uh, like we get evaluated only on the data that's inside there. And it's so it's like it's very old fashioned way to scrutinize people and uh, these it's luckily is changing uh, in, in, the, in the last few years uh, and then you have other instead uh, players which are more open and collaborative like crosser it's it, it gets metadata it's an initiative basically and uh, and any publisher subscribe to crosser initiative it's it has to send to push metadata about any publication they have into cross of course they give what they want it doesn't mean that they give the same data they have or, or with the same quality but in principle cross is just one big place where you you can find uh, more than 113 million records of publications and that's increasing this this probably this figures these uh, numbers are not up to date to today open citations is Pretty much the same thing, but for just citations. So you have like this paper is citing this other paper, this paper is citing these other papers. It's like a network, and it doesn't have any other metadata, any other thing. So if you need other extra information, you need to resolve and uh, and enrich the graph. Dimension it sits in between because it's commercial and it's a freemium premium model. So if you do research, they give you they grant you access. And uh, if you are doing that for, for, for making money out of it, like because you are a consultancy company, uh, they want to get paid. Um, but again, it's, it's based on literature. Microsoft has done the same as Google Scholar, uh, like Bing, which is the search engine. They have crawlers, they go around. Whenever they find something that looks like oh, academic, they get the metadata try to find authors and title and get all the stuff and the index in this other shadow the shadow is like a parallel index which is uh, after uh, scholarly knowledge a good thing about uh, microsoft academic is it's that it, it is everything uh, accessible like it's free to use or at least it was because sadly on december at the project is is it's uh, marked to for retirement uh there's going to be open alex which is another they're trying to basically replicate mug experiment after mug, uh is dead and uh it's going to i mean it's been launched this week so i've, I've seen that the schema is pretty much the same the papers they have venues they have uh citations and some indicators and and uh, this kind of, so it's very much literature just but they are basically trying to say okay this microsoft is going away we're going to do the same thing and try to be a once replacement uh still have to put my hands on that and semantic scholar is the last one uh in the list uh again literature focused they have rest api and json dumps uh and uh, what is nice, uh, I just discovered that it's that they have they have extensive uh, experimentation on, on authors disambiguation, which is non-trivial task. And they, I think they have they have also a data set that can be used to do evaluation of algorithms, trying to see, like trying to see this person and this person are actually the same person. And I hope to us because open air research graph it's another kid in the block so like, we do the same we try to do the same job of, of the other we take stuff together so the idea in 2019 in 2009 sorry uh is that there was an increasing uh availability of 
encryption, especially open access repositories and others uh, registries for people and projects. Uh, the one we have seen where before. And the main idea in a nutshell was to provide a single entry point uh, for, uh, for discovery and, and statistics about uh, open access and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and research. So like a, a, a global quiz system, parent research information system. Uh, it was to provide monitoring uh, services and uh, and uh, and to uh, have a better way to to assess the research research impact for funders, institutions, and research communities. Everything pointing pointing back to the original source of information. So we we didn't want to have papers. Our like we just want to have the metadata. And uh, so, like going back to your theory, more theoretical uh, knowledge. Uh, back then, we we had two choices. Like one was about data housing, so ATL, like extract transform load. Uh, so get everything in one place, mush everything together, construct an index and, and distribute it to the to the world. And the other one was uh, loosely coupled uh, integration, so to like to have digital databases that dispatches queries. This second one is not viable because the mostly the the the, 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 the literature uh, repositories that we that are available are available in batch consumption, so they can be harvested, but they don't have any capabilities for for solving queries. So the ETL was the only option uh, that could be adopted. And uh, across all the, the, I mean, the possible data that we could be, are, they could uh, are and collect, it was scattered around this kind of uh, plane uh, between closed and open and between uh, dumps and APIs and, and scraping. And of course, like closed access wasn't a fit and scraping things wasn't a fit either. Uh, scraping, it's nice if you have a small, explorative analysis like you can go to a conference and try to see uh, which are the papers that are likely published but if you want to build services on that you don't want to go for for scraping it's it's nice for for to get started but mm, not viable for for production ready uh, platforms and also like the other problem is that uh, Data is usually very good uh, as long as you don't play with it. When you start playing with it, it, it you discover that it's, it's plenty of flows and problems. And uh, most of the times, uh, like as data scientists, you spend time fixing the data and then 20% like, of the time you have, is the, is, is the time you actually dedicate for the analysis. So we had to uh, define uh, content acquisition policies and guidelines so like um if you uh, if any wanted to join open air had to comply to certain rules and uh for example have uh, certain apis to be collected and certain formats and certain and certain uh mandatory fields and uh at the beginning we were co collecting open access and recently uh we moved to also close the access metadata. And we also have a, um, within Open Air Provide, which is a set of services, we have a service that validates if your data source is compliant with these rules or not. Um, so that's the big picture. Uh, we are collecting uh, for over 400 million metadata links, uh, 40 million texts from more than 12,000 sources all over the world. And uh, and we materialize everything within a graph, where entities and uh, and that, that, that participate in the research lifecycle are connected with the semantic uh, relationship. This model uh, that of the of the graph, uh, we have at, at its core we have research products. It can be public data sets, software, or any other research product it's, as a catch-all category. And uh, research products are, are uh, connected to the organizations and, product and projects that they, they are pertaining to. And uh, we also have all the money aspect. So like who pays for the 
objects and, uh, and so on. This is done in an open and participatory way. So as I was saying before, any source, any, any, anyone that has data and wants to provide them to OpenAir is it's actually able to join. Everything is transparent. Uh, we did duplicate uh, the stuff we have, mainly the products, uh, the, so papers. Mm. And for any information we have, we also append a trust label saying how much we rely on the information that we have, if it was like given from the original source or if it's something being inferred somewhere down the line by us or by other in, in, uh, inference mechanisms. Uh, this is roughly the construction flow so like we collect everything we put all the stuff together and then we run the duplication meaning we get publications that are similar merge them together we find the best uh, representation trying to put uh, all the, the information in, in just in one manifest and there are uh, inference algorithms running on top of that and then we distribute it to the services to be fewer so uh, this is another parenthesis, uh, graphs that are not graphs. Uh, usually uh, graph, when, you, when, I mean, when someone talks to me um, about graphs, I think about RTF and graph stores. Well, in this domain, you sometimes you find out that there's no like real graph graph, as you are saying, like clearly the, the system model is clearly graph because you have entities that are, it's a web of things. But um, both Microsoft Academy graph is not a graph. Actually, like when you download the thing, it's a bunch of, of, of CSV files. And uh, so it's textual. And uh, then you have keys. So it looks like a dump of a relational database. Uh, uh, then, and then you can jump between entities by uh, keys. Um, there are some exceptions, uh, SciGraph and scholarly data, they're rather small, but you can, as I was saying before, you can, you can load it on, on a trifle store. You can do lots of things. Uh, for the others, it's probably safer other data management uh, solutions, like in OpenAir, we have Hadoop, which is, are you familiar with Hadoop? Hadoop ever? Okay, great. Anyway, like everything is on uh, GFS. Uh, then you have HBase uh, for for running query like as it was a, a relational database. Uh, lots of strategies, uh, Spark and MapReduce are available. So um, we have a couple of clusters. So one is for production and beta, and the other one is testing. Uh, and at the moment, we are transitioning to a full on cluster premise uh, implementation. At the beginning, we we were using for so the, the first uh, barrier of collection was uh, a NoSQL database where we had stores of XML files. Everything was pushed there, and then at some point down the line, we were loading on on uh, on HBase on uh, HDFS to run inference and uh, and the application. But now we are trying to transition to a, to a full on cluster implementation because this is not sustainable anymore. And, uh, and and also because it's it's easier to explore the data if it's, if it's everything in one place with the same tooling. And uh, with the graph, we fuel a number of services. Explore is the web um, portal for search and uh, and for faceting facet search and drill down and so on. Connect is a tool for communities. So there are a number of research communities that are registered and we serve. And we deliver to them a dashboard where they find all the problems. So it's basically a, 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 it's like a tailored view of the graph for their community. So they find only the products they need and the data they need uh, that are relevant to their work with the metrics and trends and so on uh, that are uh, of their interest. Develop is programmatic access to the graph. So you can run queries uh, over the graph. And monitor is the dashboard for stakeholders. And this is the one we provide to the European Commission. So the European Commission is that it's giving us money to provide them but a, a service because they want to know, for example, how this paper describes better uh, what we are doing. But they want to know basically like how much is the open, open access push of, uh, of the 
publishing of, of, of research in Europe. They want to know these kind of things, like how, how the open access is going, how it's going over the years, uh, how uh, what what kind of open access publications, how, how open access covers different different uh, types of publications. If it's an article, if it's a conference, a book series, and uh, and so on. I mean, you name it, like by country, it's uh, lots of graphs. Who's, who's the, who are the biggest funders that, that support and implement open access mandates, uh, which are the countries that publish open access data sets, open access software, and so on. It's a very long thing. It's easier to go there and try to see on the website. Uh, so um, final part. Okay. I was fast. Uh, challenges and ideas. Um, so, uh, so as I said, we collect from over uh, twelve thousand sources, and this is rather complicated because uh, we do that to produce a new graph. Is actually true because we have production and beta. Uh, we try to do that in theory. Uh, it's, kind of complicated to, to stick to the um, schedule uh, every 15 days. And uh, limited time, limited uh, and it involves at least three research groups, like one in, in Pisa, one in Athens, and one in Poland. Um, and, uh, and we have stakeholders and project partners that are chasing us if there are mistakes. All this is close to insane. Uh, so any mechanism that is this process is valuable i can say it's hours if not days of work in, in any country view uh, so this is for example we are moving one of the reasons why we're moving everything on cluster premises uh, another thing uh, it, it's about graph consistency and quality checks um, so again Collecting uh, over from over 12k uh, sources, it's a problem. If a data source it's flickering, then you can have uh, data loss. Then you have metrics that you are monitoring drop. Uh, the stats that you are publishing on the website suddenly change from one week to another. Like you, you might have uh, these publications and then a chunk get lost and. Uh, People that are looking, like the European Commission, that are looking at the data, cannot make sense of what they're publishing. So they get hungry, and stakeholders get uh, unsatisfied, and uh, and all these. On top of that, there's the fact that we are. It's not like that infrastructure is is it's fixed. Like we are working on that to add more things. Palo is a great uh, source of ideas and, st and new stuff to to add. So um, these all, all, all these kind of things add a, a, a layers and layers of complexity on, on our product, on production maintenance of uh, all open air. And um, as a matter of fact, like back in 2017, my work as a D was about data flow quality monitoring in data infrastructure in general, but then uh, it was meant to solve some problems that we had in open air, like the idea was to sensors around the infrastructures, like trying to see uh, if uh, in, in data in the index or in other data back then, uh, the metrics over time were consistently growing or at least stable, never dropping. And uh, if there were problems, then you should trigger some issue to, to us before pushing the button and publishing everything uh, on, the, on, the, on the storefront, like saying, where, where people can see that things are not uh, are not going well. Uh, so now we have new tools that a new dashboard uh, that have been integrated in in the system. For example, Grafana. Uh, there are some integration issues. Uh, what I've done back in 2017 is still where I placed it in 2017. So there would be we need to find a way to to bring it back to the to bring it back to move it to the new uh, monitoring tools. So that's something that we are investigating on. Uh, there's another big thing about interoperability. So all these graphs are separated initiatives. Like uh, in open air, we are, we are rather collaborative, but there are other people that they mind their own business. They go there, they integrate things, and they don't care much about being out there. 
and to work with others. And uh, so there is a high fragmentation, isolation, and the information is put in an information silo. And uh, this means that we do the same things over and over again over time. And, uh, and, and it's badly affected by low levels of synergy. So having an interoperability framework for open sense graphs would mean that uh, we would gain from diversity and plurality. And if at any point, all the, the knowledge and information that any that each open science graph uh, collaborates to and, and creates, if all this information flow back, if any one of if any of these initiative uh, dies, like Mag Ahmad is an example, is leaving at the end of the year, anything they 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 produced it would be in principle lost with them, unless there is a mechanism to to make this knowledge flow back to the others and be consumed to the others. Mag is a good, I mean, it's a bad example in this sense because they released everything for free. So in principle, you can you can get the stuff and, and integrate it still, even if Mag is not available anymore. But uh, like, for example, in open air, what we do is that whenever we infer new relations and new metadata that are missing, uh, we tell uh, the original sources that hey there might be something that you wanna um, update in your in your in your original data because like the bottom line is we disappear we hope not but if we disappear we wouldn't like to have all our work lost and all these years of 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 data integration disappear uh, out of the blue uh, another massive problem is about entity disambiguation uh these two papers here i don't know if you can see but basically there are two authors here which are two authors there the title is the same and i can grant you because I read them they are not the same article and yet i have my reference management uh application which is uh so at the moment which every day tells me do you want to marry because he thinks he thinks that that these these two papers are actually the same and uh, so for us it, it's not it's rather simple to see that they are not but for algorithms that that's not that easy and the same happens and this is also a kind of tricky for us uh these are examples um there is this lily it's a name surname probably asian and her, um, on on names like they work in different things and uh, it's not easy to see which one of uh, two, four, seven versions you are, you are in front of. The other uh, is about uh, a guy that has a lot of different ways to uh, write his name when he's writing papers, uh, which means that uh, if you want to do that in an algorithmic way, it's crazy to see that you are, yes, indeed, uh, talking about the same person. Um, the same happens to, um, to institutions like ISTCNR and the Institute of Information Science and Technology, Alessandro Faedro, CNR, Pisa 56124 Italy is the same thing. But if you do a distance, uh, string distance metric, it's clearly not close. So you need to find some some clever ways to to understand that uh, these two variations are the same. Open orgs, by the way, the product of ours uh, is not still is not public yet, I think. But it's we have been working on that, trying to have one database of all possible variations of uh, of um, of uh, organization names and uh, have them uh, reconciled and uh, and deduplicated. So entity disambiguation is, is kind of easy for us and less trivial for algorithms. Often there is no truth. So like if you want to do something with machine learning, uh, it's a big problem because you don't have a uh, gold standard and uh, you need to go either to manual tagging or you can find some gold standard, but which is rather limited. So. Not, not always easy to find to, to find the right approach to tackle this problem. Then you have name, name variation and polysemy. 
multiple cards, like Greek alphabets, Cyrillic alphabet, all the Asians ones, like how do you deal them? How do you do uh, comparisons with, uh, with Latin cards? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big problem. And yeah, multilingual as well. Um, so um, another, yeah, this example here I shouldn't be there. Anyway, another challenge is about literature, everything that concerns literature and research data. So this is about like finding new indicators for open science. I was saying at the beginning when I was talking about citations that uh, traditionally like citations are is one of the ways uh, where that, that, that governs the ways that we are mostly evaluated uh, with. And um, with the transition to open science, lots of the institutions are leaving these old fashioned indicators and they move to other ways to, to assess and to evaluate people. And uh, so there's a need to find and to define new metrics, new indicators that are able to, to assess the quality of, of your work and how, for example, how open is your way of doing science. Uh, there's a big fuss about uh, credit redistribution, uh, meaning that if you, um, if you publish a data set, then that, uh, and you place it there and then is used by someone else that go and for, for another piece of research and it ends up being a major breakthrough and it's very, something very important, which is based on your data set, you should get some credit as well. I mean, you, have, you didn't do that job, but you did something that's enabling for the job. So you did something that's important and it wasn't a paper, it was data. So this is not covered by, by traditional uh, mechanisms of, uh, of citation, it's something new. And uh, we need to understand how this can be done and implemented. And um, there is also another um, another interesting thing is about data contribution and authorship. Uh, for example, this is something uh, I was talking, uh, I was um, discussing with uh, Ornella today. So, like the, the, the research question is whether there's a difference between how people get uh, attribution of literature, of papers, and research data. It's like, do um, professors um, participate to the um, data process deposition? Like, do, do they have uh, any interest in being on software or on research data? Uh, is, are the authors the same, the authors the same of, uh, of the, the, the ones that participate to the to the writing the paper and the ones that participate to the publishing of the, of the construction of a data set are the same are the shuffled so this is something that probably i mean i hope we are going to work on that soon and then there is um or is, is a, um, some, a research a research line that goes around a workshop a workshop that i've been organizing recently um, so, like research is a complex phenomenon, and uh, in, in this uh, geopolitical and social economic context, and uh, it would be nice to try to find anything that, uh, that any influence back and forth between re academia and anything that's around. And for example, here uh, there was um, I tried to. Uh, to picture the, the contributions to conferences, the submissions to conferences after uh, Trump's ban for, for seven countries in the Middle East. And there was a drop uh, in the metrics, probably, I mean, we don't, we don't have right causation for, the, the, for this drop because it could be war, not Trump. But anyway, uh, like there are um, political factors that, that can affect uh, how people publish and uh, how they place their contributions around. COVID-19 is another one, like how, this, how did COVID-19 disrupt research? And like, how did it change? Like people didn't move, people didn't change up possibly. Uh, so, all these things. Uh, another is a political readjustment, um, like geopolitical events, like a new country joins the European Union or Brexit like how this, does this uh, affect uh, the, 
the, the, the, the organization of projects, of, uh, of collaborations, and so on. So our conclusions. Uh, science is a complex global scale self-organizing evolving network of papers, researches, and projects and ideas. It's in, it is influenced and influences uh, the surrounding geopolitical economic context, and it moves lots of money. Uh, so there are lots of public data and data sources that we can uh, use uh, to infer new knowledge and understand uh, better how the which are the mechanisms regulated in science. And uh, yeah, our team, we are working on these projects. We have a couple of more that are under review at the moment. Uh, and uh, yeah, we work, in our, I mean, I went into details, I don't want to repeat myself. And um, that we have interest and challenges in identifying new in indicators for um, measuring uh, fairness, openness, and impact uh, and credit uh, readjustments. Open science monitoring and analytics over our graph, but not only. This is our happy faces. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. I hope it wasn't too. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. We're all set on one hour and 20 minutes and see an hour, so that's perfect. Uh, Anthony has a bit of time. Good, good. Uh, so are there questions for our guests? Uh, any doubt? Okay. Online, no? Yes, yes. Okay. So I think you had a an overview of uh, scholarly communications, everything you can do, that's a very complex world, as you have seen, with uh, many uh, things involved, so you need to learn how all this system of sciences works. And once you know that, to manage the data and create services and make everything works, it's very complex. And so you see also how our competencies can be put into use, you know, in the real world for real services used by hundreds of people. <laughs> and I think it was uh, good to see what you can do and what are possible applications of our knowledge. So about graph databases, articles, and stuff. So that 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 was the idea. Now, uh, I think you can put everything.